Welcome to Zero Knowledge. I'm your host, Anna Rose. In this podcast, we will be exploring the latest in zero knowledge research and the decentralized web, as well as new paradigms that promise to change the way we interact and transact online. This week, Guillermo and I catch up with Henry de Valence from Penumbra. In this, we discuss his thoughts on the requirements for adoption of privacy systems, how these ideas led him to develop Penumbra. We then dig into how Penumbra aims to use privacy features not as nice-to-haves within a system, but rather as essential components that offer a new paradigm for how to think about DeFi in a multi-chain ecosystem. Quick disclosure, the ZK Validator was an early investor in Penumbra. But before we kick off, I want to share an announcement from one of our recent ZK Summit partners, Anoma. Anoma has released a new white paper that better describes their system and architecture. It also shows how all the awesome cryptographic libraries they've been developing fit together. Find this paper at anoma.net slash papers. We'll add the link in the show notes and be sure to check it out. I also want to highlight that there is a fresh batch of jobs over on the ZK Jobs Board. If you're looking for a new opportunity to work with the best teams in ZK, be sure to check out their job postings. I'll add the link in the show notes as well. Now, Tanya will share a little bit about this week's sponsor. Today's episode is sponsored by Alio. Alio is a new layer one blockchain that achieves the programmability of Ethereum, the privacy of Zcash, and the scalability of a rollup. If you're interested in building private applications, then check out Alio's programming language called Leo. Leo enables non-cryptographers to harness the power of ZKPs to deploy decentralized exchanges, hidden information games, regulated stable coins, and more. Visit leo-lang.org to start building. That's leo-lang.org. You can also participate in Alio's incentivized testnet 3 by downloading and running a Snark OS node. No signup is necessary to participate. For questions, join their Discord at alio.org forward slash Discord. So thanks again, Alio. Now here is Anna and Guillermo's chat with Henry from Penumbra. Today we're going to be talking about Penumbra with Henry de Valence. I'm here with Guillermo. We're going to be covering this project the day after ZK Summit 8. We're all a little tired, but I do want to welcome you both to the show. Thanks. It's great to be here. Thank you. That's great to be back. So, Henry, you gave a great presentation yesterday at the summit. I want to talk about Penumbra. But before we do that, you've been on the show before, and there's been, I assume, like quite a story since then. It's, we recorded in 20, like April 2020. I would love to hear a little bit about like what has happened since then. What have you been up to? Uh, yeah, so I think at the time um, I had been working on one of the projects to do privacy preserving contact tracing. And that eventually I think got subsumed by the Apple Google version of that protocol. I went back to working on uh, Zebra which is the Zcash Foundation's uh, Zcash full node implementation. And then uh, towards the end of uh, 2020, I sort of felt like it was time to kind of move on and have a little bit of a break. And then in, in the first part of 2021, sorry, the years of the pandemic are all like <laughs> no mashed together. <laughs> but in the, in the first part of 2021, I had some time off, I, you know, there's only so many hills that you can like hike up before you go back to thinking about blockchains. And then that's kind of how I started thinking about the problem space that eventually evolved into Penumbra. And kind of reflecting on the experience of spending, say, you know, four years working on various kinds of ZK tooling infrastructure, trying to build all the necessary um, technical Legos to build the kinds of private systems that I wanted to exist in the world. And yet at the same time, looking around at the ecosystem and seeing, well, there's like all of the projects that people actually use. And then there are the private projects. And this Venn diagram has like an uncomfortable resemblance to just two distinct circles. Oof. <laughs> um, and as somebody who's right, like if you if you spend all of your time, like actually like, you're, you know, you're sort of pouring your soul into these technical artifacts. The idea of, oh, I'm I'm just kind of yeeting all this stuff out into the world and it is never really getting used. Um, it's not not a great feeling. And so. um. So yeah, I had a process of, of thinking through sort of 
what would it look like to have some kind of theory of, of change for, for how people would actually start using private blockchains? And what is the reason that people aren't using existing privacy tools? And is there some way that you can kind of hook these things together and find something where you get like actually good market fit for a privacy product. Mm. And what I mean by that is it's not just, oh, I'm, I'm trying to build this thing and it's private and people will use it because it's private. Like, how do you break out of this mode of, oh, I want to build a private X, which means like it does, this is a thing, it does X. It's like kind of worse at it, but it's private. So mm -hmm. like maybe people will want to use it, right? Like that's not really a compelling product pitch. How do you get to, you know, we're building a better X and the reason that it's better is because it has these privacy features yeah. and we don't have to spend time arguing about like, oh, is privacy a human right? You know, I, I, I'm believe in that, but I don't want to have a, I, I don't think it's workable to build technical products that are like based on, on that as a pitch. You have to build something that's actually like better for what people want to do. It sounds pragmatic. It's like looking at human nature. We can wish that people cared about privacy or we can make it so useful, so, so much better to actually use these private systems anyways. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that's, I would push back on that framing a little bit in a, in a way that I think is hopefully interesting, um, which is, I think when you look around, there's actually a lot of evidence that people do really care about their privacy, but when people make choices like this is the whole th reason that i think like the the idea of like revealed preference is bullshit a lot of the time <laughs> what do you mean by that so revealed preference is the idea that like oh if you want to know like what somebody's preference is then like instead of asking them for their opinion you just like look at what they do because that's sort of like revealing their like true you know choice or pr preference or whatever mm. but what that misses is that when people make choices they make those in some specific contexts and the entire like technical infrastructure of our society has been carefully crafted so that those choices cause people to choose to do things that benefit various corporate entities right like the choice of oh do i want to have google reading all of my emails right if somebody is just asking me that you know abstractly of course no i would rather not that they not do that mm -hmm. but the scope of that choice in practical terms is, do I want to never communicate with anyone via email because every other person that I would want to talk to already has a Gmail account and so they're going to be getting all of the email anyway. So I don't actually have a meaningful choice about my privacy, you know, based on sort of what email provider I use or something. I mean, there's a whole thing too, right? Like, People have been trying to self-host email lately, but because of like a bunch of reasons like spam first, but also secondarily like Google, Microsoft, et cetera, will just like reject your emails outright if you're self-hosting unless you do like jump through all of these like crazy hoops because otherwise they just like assume it's spam. So even well, like- and, and I think uh, not to be like, you know, the Microsoft defender, but like also likely it is. Right. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. like th there's also an interesting story that I think is relevant to to blockchains or other decentralized systems about email, where you have this sort of purely decentralized protocol where there's no real kind of economic model. And then you have this spam problem, which you can think of as sort of like this resource ab usage abuse issue. Mm -hmm. And the way that that has actually been solved is that email is a centralized system that is like dressed up in a decentralized protocol. Google just reads everybody's emails and figures out what the spam is and then bans it. And that's why email works. Yep. And, and I think part of the challenge of building a decentralized protocol in general is how do you account for enough of the economic logic of the system internally to the, the logic of the system itself so that if it's successful, you don't have a situation where some monopolist has to come in and close that commons and then centrally manage the resources to like take account of that sort of lack of economic model. So, I mean, I think the 
problem with like email and its naive incarnation, right, is now this is just a restatement of your points, but there's a mismatch between economic incentives of like bad actors and like economic incentives of good actors, right? Like you are, it, it is very easy for someone to kind of like, maybe, maybe this is a weird term, but maybe DOS the commons um, simply because it is like very simple, very cheap to do so, right? While the cost burden of that kind of externality, right, is very expensive for a user because like sifting through, you know, 5,000 pages of like spam bullshit is usually like particularly costly for any one individual. Yeah, I think that the the phenomenon is more general than that, though, too, because another example that I think about is GitHub, where you have Git, which is this decentralized system, a decentralized protocol. And although it is uh, at the protocol level decentralized, in practice, the way that Git works is that everybody has a GitHub account and GitHub hosts all the repos. And I think part of that story is that the social infrastructure of doing code collaboration requires like various kinds of technical infrastructure, mm -hmm. like hosting, like issues, having some kind of system to keep track of proposed changes that isn't just like people emailing each other on a mailing list. <laughs> um, and because those aren't part of the system, they end up being provided by Microsoft, who pays to maintain all of that infrastructure so that they can sort of have ownership over this like developing community. Do you feel like that too? And obviously there's been proposals to decentralize that, but it's just so enormous, like a, an endeavor that it's, it's very slow to happen. I think it would be good, probably better. You know, if, if somebody makes like a better thing, that would be great. It is a lot of work. Um, I know that like, for, for instance, like radical yeah, yeah. is trying to build, um, some alternative, but rebuilding like social infrastructure is a lot of work. You know, that's this whole um, tangent digression that's hopefully interesting to the listeners. But where we got onto <laughs> this, right, was this idea of how do you build a system that can provide private infrastructure, but with some kind of self-sustaining feedback loop that actually drives people to want to use that system as a, as a product. Privacy is actually really interesting in that it has very strong network effects, right? The, the larger the anonymity set is, the better the privacy. Um, or even like the more people participating in private systems, even like say it was like email or something, then you don't have that kind of like, or maybe it's the opposite. If there's more people participating in the very non-private, it reduces the privacy of all, even those who are being careful about it. So I'm guessing the opposite is true. If more people are careful about privacy, then generally that privacy, not even the set, but just like there aren't the level of surveillance that you would have otherwise. Yeah. Right. So, By the way, just a note to the listener, we are recording this, as mentioned, the day after the ZK Summit 8. So if we are slow, aka if I am slow, <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> so, yeah, but, but also more generally, right, like the more people that use a system, which is anonymous by default, the harder it is to pinpoint any one individual person. Right. So this is this is an, yeah. another notion of like anonymity as well. So that was one kind of line of thought. So we'll just sort of pause that and we'll see how these intersect in a, in a minute. The <laughs> second line of thought that I had at the time was thinking about why um, people weren't really using um, Zcash specifically, um, since that was what I had been working on. And I got to this perspective of, of kind of con concluding that although payments are held up and have been held up, you know, since Bitcoin was created, right? It's like a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. The whole idea is like, we're going to do payments. And that's like the simplest possible thing. It's like the MVP for building uh, blockchains. And if we can do payments, that means we're onto something. And if we can't do payments, that means we're failing at the most basic thing. And my conclusion was actually that that is completely backwards. And that payments are actually like the hardest possible thing to build. Uh, and the reason for that is that the, the simplicity of a payment transaction, oh, I, I have some ledger, there's value in this 
account or address and it goes to this other address and I'm just like, you know, there's numbers moving around in the database is actually a, a totally superficial simplicity. And the reason is that the economic transaction is always bigger than the transaction that gets recorded on chain. So whenever somebody makes a payment, there's always two sides of that flow, yeah. right? You have some flow some of good tokens. Some goods exchanged of, for exactly. funds. That's right. And, and even you don't the, see the goods. Yeah, even yeah. in the case of, you know, for instance, like a donation, like you can still think that there's some kind of like abstract flow in the opposite direction. Like somebody is, you know, getting good feelings about contributing to some project or something. And so you have a situation where the technical part of the system is recording only half yeah. of the full economic transaction. And so in order to, to use that usefully, you have to have this whole parallel social infrastructure of where that counterflow is happening off chain. And when you're trying to bootstrap that, you're running into the sort of technology with the strongest possible network effects in human history, mm -hmm. which is money, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so it actually feels to me like, can you do payments on a blockchain is I think going to be sort of like the final boss of this like cypherpunk dream where like, you know, blockchains take over the world or something. And in the meantime, chasing down payments is kind of this like Moby Dick, like white whale of like, this is the thing that, you know, and all these other projects have like, you know, failed to do this, but mine will be totally different. And, you know, at every, every point the the ship just gets wrecked. Do you sort of talk, is, are you saying something like you'd need to be building or bringing that value more on chain, the other side of that transaction before you could really accomplish this payments? Would it work more in digital goods in a way? So the, the thing that I was, was thinking about at the time was, was actually th reflecting on um, seeing the DeFi summer happen, you know, mm -hmm. over the last, at the time, it was like over the, the preceding six or eight months. And the thing that I think is really interesting about all of these DeFi protocols is that, okay, although what those tokens are is kind of limited, the types of transactions that people were making with DeFi systems were ones where the entire economic logic of that transaction was included in the blockchain transaction. Like when right. somebody makes a Uniswap trade on Ethereum, they don't need to have like some kind of counterparty that they've arranged with off chain to do blah, blah, blah. They just say, okay, this is a thing that is going to be useful to me. I've decided that I want to make this trade and now I'm going to do it. And what's really powerful about that is that if you're trying to get adoption, you've created a scenario where individual people can decide to start using the system without having to pre-coordinate with anybody else. And I think this is actually the key thing that makes payments so hard. It's that what are we building when we're building blockchains? We're building this coordination tool. But if you can't do the thing on chain directly, if you have to do off chain coordination, then it's like, oh, before I can use the coordination tool, I first have to somehow coordinate before I can coordinate. Totally. And I think that that makes it much harder to get adoption. Whereas if you can start with something like, you know, uh, some kind of DeFi application where people are able to get direct value out of transactions that they can make themselves. That's a much better way to bootstrap a user base because once all those people are on the system, then, you know, maybe actually payments do kind of work, right? If you look at where crypto payments are really successful, like there's a lot of use of crypto payments by crypto people, but that's because they're all already in the system. And so the thought was like, okay, could you, could you have some kind of like DeFi functionality that would let you build a private system where individual people could make a choice to start using it without having to first sort of pre-coordinate with some other counterparty. You know, how would they even find that person, right? And the place where those two lines of thought kind of converged was thinking about, okay, of all the DeFi stuff, is there an application where we're having privacy 
is actually this kind of like killer feature where you can actually be better as a, as an X because you have control over information disclosure. And in that case, uh, or in, in that um, sort of framing, trading is a really, really interesting use case because every market is also a market in information. If you think that like the, per, you know, one of the purposes of a market is to determine prices, then, you know, that market activity is some kind of like decentralized computational process where people are sharing information, whatever, like it's, it's, it's a really like fundamental part of the dynamics of that system. And so if you, if you're looking out at all this, like DeFi trading where everybody has to reveal everything to everybody at all times, it's so obvious that like that can never be the best system because it's just completely missing this whole like giant part of like what makes that such a like deep and interesting dynamic. I mean, market dynamics, I mean. Um, Are you thinking, so when you say this, it definitely makes me think of like strategies of certain groups being exposed and then I guess people just copying those strategies over and over again. Why is a private system better? I, I think that the the idea of sort of a market as being a market in information is such a fundamental thing that you can actually see that in a lot of different types of behavior. So one really obvious example is like all this, you know, front running. Mm -hmm. um, fundamentally, that's about somebody sort of revealing information before they can do their action and then that being exploited. Um, on the strategy front, right, uh, exactly as you mentioned, if somebody has some kind of strategy where they've you know, done a bunch of statistics and figured out what their estimation of the prices is, if somebody else can just like clone all of that without actually having to do the work themselves, that kind of limits the incentive to do that kind of uh, work. Mm -hmm. um, and there's other cases like, for instance, with market makers, generally a market maker wants to stay flat with regard to price movements, right? Their goal is basically trying to make a little bit on every trade and not get ro rolled over by being wrong. And so if somebody can figure out, okay, I've carefully watched this market maker's activity, I can kind of reverse engineer what their strategy is. Another thing is instead of cloning it, if you can predict like what the like 2% of times they're gonna make a wrong prediction are, then you as a trader can like roll in a huge order right when you think they're gonna do a mispricing and that can like totally wreck their whole economics, right? Yeah, this is a very famous term called adverse selection is the fact that um, if information is kind of known ahead of time and could be used, it can also be exploited. Um, which of course, as we know from MEV is a, is a very, is, I mean, MEV in, in many ways, uh, like on chain is like a market and in information where not only do you have kind of the statistical notion of information, but you have a very, very concrete information about, you know, exactly what someone's going to do and when it'll get included in a block, and then you can do things to trade against it. So privacy here is a very interesting, um, idea, right? Because essentially if you could somehow, I mean, this is, this is, people have been thinking about this for a very long time, not quite in this framing, but just more generally, right? It's like, if you can prevent this from happening, this information leakage from happening in the first place, then congratulations, you've kind of like achieved, you've kind of cut out a huge part of this kind of, you know, people using knowledge that it's kind of silly that it gets leaked uh, in order to trade against a certain person or something like that. Do you think it would become like that? The thing is that very transparent system has created a whole range of new strategies and attitudes mm -hmm. and ways of doing it in the private system. Is it a, is it sort of a return to previous market types or is it, it in itself a brand new playing field with like brand new ways that people would interact on it? <laughs> I think, are you thinking about this? Yeah, I think so. The, the thing that I think is really interesting is that, and that this is kind of an, a whole other tangent that also comes in, you know, we'll get to at some point when we talk about the, the in technical a later side. section in the paper, yeah. we'll, uh, we'll, we'll but, speak about this. But another kind of interesting and underappreciated aspect of this is that if you try to build a private market, the problem isn't just, okay, how do we make everything private? Like, how do you just like make like every piece of this whole system private and it's all completely ZK and blah, 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 blah. Well, actually nobody wants to have a market 
where literally every piece of information is private because like you want to know like how much liquidity is there like what kind of trades are there hap like are happening in general what is the aggregate state of the market what is the price of the market right so y there's a very there's a much more kind of subtle and interesting problem of privacy which is how do you have privacy for individual actions so that you know some individual trader doesn't have their specific trade front run or some market maker can have their strategy concealed but you still have some kind of aggregate information about what is you know the total trading volume what is the aggregate set of all of the liquidity that's available how is that moving around so that all the participants in the the system are able to make uh, choices based on that information. To go back to your question of, is this just a kind of return to tradition or is this something genuinely new? I think that there's a possibility for private DeFi to build this kind of hybrid best of both worlds uh, situation where you can keep some of the confidentiality of you know people being able to do trading without leaking their strategy, but also you're in this totally open and permissionless environment. Like if you look at the way that traditional trading works on like a, like a centralized exchange, the entity that's running the exchange actually you know, sees everything that everybody is doing all the time and just like doesn't tell that to other traders, mm -hmm. like hopefully, right? But also now you have like the NYSE or something, which is this, you know, like centralized entity that gets to like gatekeep like people's access to price feeds, right? Like you can't even like get prices without paying a bunch of money to some data provider. Whereas in a blockchain system, like it, there is a, a much greater degree of kind of permissionlessness uh, in, in terms of access to the system. So I think now would be a really good time to talk about Penumbra. Uh, not just in generality, but in specificity. Yeah, I mean, Is I think a... we've given those some some really, I mean, just the the thinking and sort of the path that you were on in kind of intellectually that leads up to this more tangible project. Tell me a little bit about the beginning of Penumbra. Like, where where does this start? Yeah, so with all that, you know, just kind of like hold up like context, you know, somewhere in your mind, the, the <laughs> kind of how do we actually manifest this is what kind of became Penumbra, the thought is, if we want to have the genuinely private, decentralized infra financial infrastructure that, that we think is important to exist in the world, can we build a private trading system that lets people do things better because it's private and use that to like bootstrap the system sort of creation, its use, its adoption, etc. So that's how I started on the project. Um, at the time, I was kind of in this like awkward period of um, visa-related limbo. Oh yeah. The U.S. just like never issued me a work permit because they're <laughs> yeah. The, oh, I think I, I remember this. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so yeah. We, we don't have to get into this yeah. whole thing. Like the U.S. immigration system is just like <laughs> very bad and just dysfunctional. Yeah. Um, Do we but, think Canada's better? Mm. I've never just, been on the receiving end of it, so yeah. who knows? I just found out today that Henry and I are both Canadian. That's yeah. cool. But yeah, we don't know what our immigration is. <laughs> well, um, you guys have points, actually. It's not actually, so bad. Actually, I heard it's actually, I heard you could it's, do it if you don't live in Canada. I, yeah. I have no idea. Anyway. And, and so at the time, I was kind of stuck in this position where it's like, okay, well, I can't technically, you know, work on anything, but I can just sort of like do research, publish ideas, uh, put them out into the world and sort of see what ripples come back. And so I had started writing up kind of this like design sketch as a kind of a way to like occupy time until, you know, someday uh, when I would get some kind of clarity. <laughs> Wait, I kind of remember this. This is uh, like when we were talking about the privacy results, actually. Differential privacy? No, prior to oh. that. This was like... Oh, yeah. Um, this was like the first half of 2021. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so that was mainly a way to kind of stay occupied um, and sort of actually set the course on building in public. Um, it turns out that if you just post a bunch of ideas on the internet... Um, sometimes people will read them mm. and sometimes those people will have a 
technical background that is like totally different from your own. And because of that, they can tell you things like, oh, actually, you should do X instead of Y, or you should go <laughs> read this paper um, or whatever, right? <laughs> um, and, and so that was like pretty cool and, and quite rewarding. And then eventually over the summer, you know, that kind of situation got resolved. And by that point, I had kind of spent enough time thinking about this that I realized that I really wanted to... Uh, actually make this real and and so then you know started trying to get get it together to to build a team and try to like incubate this project um that got underway for real uh about last september so we're almost exactly a year into the development of the project and since then we've continued to iterate on the the design and we've also built uh, most of an implementation. Cool. I think what we do need to hear is what is Penumbra? So we've talked like, and now we know it as sort of an org, yeah. like from what we had talked about before the markets, what mm -hmm. is it today? Cause yeah. also I do want to say like, and we'll add maybe links to this. I remember when you were first started on the project, there was like the private validator sets. There's like a lot of different places where privacy was being explored, but where did you land? Yeah. Um, so Probably the, the succinct way to put that is uh, Penumbra is a fully private proof of stake L1. And inside of that blockchain, there is one multi asset shielded pool that records all of the value in the system. We have a uh, shielded staking system that gives uh, privacy to delegators, but you know, still accountability and transparency for the validators. And we have uh, integration with IBC. So any IBC compatible chain, whether that's a Cosmos chain or any other um, place where IBC has been implemented, they can transfer assets into Penumbra. As those assets come in, they are recorded in the shielded pool. So the privacy boundary of the system is actually the boundary of the chain. And once you have those assets inside of Penumbra, uh, we have a shielded DEX that allows people to do um, either sealed input batch swaps on the kind of market taker side. So when somebody submits a swap, they say, I'm, I want to trade you know, this amount of this token for this other token. The input is encrypted and batch together with all the other swap intent in that block, executed at a, a common clearing price, and only the sort of aggregate batch total of what the, the trading flow for that entire pair is, is revealed. So you can have long-term privacy even for individual trade amounts. That's kind of on the, the market taker side, which is one sort of point in this trade-off between how much privacy you do get versus how much control over your trade execution do you get? The other trade-off point that we have is on the market maker side where we have all concentrated liquidity and the concentrated liquidity positions themselves are public, but they're created out of this shielded pool and they're returned back into the shielded pool. And the positions themselves are immutable so it's not like, you know, on Ethereum where there's some account and it like owns certain positions and it can change them over time. It's that, you know, a position is created and then maybe the position will be closed and later another position will be created. But there's not any way to link together what the history of those positions are. And especially in a context where a market maker has some kind of more complex trading strategy, they're likely going to be saying, okay, I have this, this is my desired trading function. I'm going to approximate that using various like smaller individual positions and which positions correspond to like which market maker or their strategy is not revealed. Maybe you could try to estimate, do some kind of statistical guessing, but really what you see is just the aggregate of here, are all the liquidity positions and that's kind of the like market view of what prices are, but you don't get to see any individual market makers. Can I check something? When you talk about the different liquidity 
positions having sort of this immutability is that similar to like the nft like thing we see in uniswap v3 like is it sort of unique yeah and it and maybe it's not an nft per se but like where it's like it's it's in itself it's not just the collection of tokens in a setting it's like produces a new token of some kind or some sort of representation yeah it's a it's an nft in like the technical sense and mm. not in the like monkey picture yeah yeah, sense. yeah i shouldn't <laughs> um, different words we need but, different words <laughs> uh but yeah so so similar to to uni v3 um except very private or parts of it being private so the the difference is the that the actual lp data and the that forms that nft that is public because that's part of what the market state is. Right. What's private is who controls that position and where the funds for that position came from. So unlike in, say, Ethereum, where everything is sort of going back to some account that controls it on Penumbra, all of these positions are just, you know, there are more tokens that are in the shielded pool. So the data that's revealed when someone creates a liquidity position is... Okay, there's a transaction. It spent some funds from the shielded pool. Uh, it put them into a, a position. You know what what the details of that position are is public, but that position is then controlled by this bearer token, which is an, an NFT, and that NFT is also recorded in the shielded pool. Interesting, just like any other asset. Wow, so like those are mixed in, sort of helping to even grow that anonymity set like more yeah. types of tokens yes okay all, all you can see is like it effectively okay there was a transfer of like you know 100 atom and like you know 20 usdc or something into this position and that's it right no, i mean overall it's a it's like a very interesting architecture because even even on the lp side you well you don't get privacy of the positions themselves, you get privacy in that, like, you get this notion of kind of unlinkability. There's like a statistical notion of linkability, right? Like, if I knew your strategy ahead of time, I could maybe try to unscrew whatever you've been doing, but I would never know that it was actually you, other than like by knowing ahead of time that I knew what you were going to do and like kind of. It's a little bit worse than that um, from a privacy standpoint. And like, one way that 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 you could have um, linkability between positions is like, you know, suppose somebody closes a position and then in the next block, they right. open a new position that has, you know, the, roughly the same amount of capital, but like the bounds are like slightly shifted yes. over. Somebody could infer that actually that's probably the same person. And this is why any kind of private system that doesn't have privacy of amounts is actually kind of dangerous from a from a privacy standpoint because if you're not careful about like what your amounts are uh and like what information you're revealing with the the amounts you can potentially leak a fair amount of information but but the thought is that how like, is that how why that seems like counterintuitive no well <laughs> like by not having the information you leak the information oh no sorry if the system reveals the amount that actually reveals quite a lot of information uh, about what the activity is. I see. So an even an even sillier example, which like has happened, uh, I think in some cases, is um, people have tagged the end of like certain. So for example, you know, you have a bunch of like decimal places in a token, right? And what you do is, let's say, you know, at the fifteenth decimal place, you put one, two, three, four, five. And so someone who isn't really paying a lot of attention, so like, you know, let's say I've, I've given you, we're, we're all doing a bunch of shielded things. I give you whatever, 10.0000000001234 penumbra. And you're like, oh, cool. I have like 10 penumbra because a lot of, you know, wallets will not show you the 15th through 18th decimal place. Um, what can happen is if you then, go, so, you know, every, let's say everything is completely private and then you, you then go, uh, and, you know, for some reason or another, uh, unshield that specific value because let's say you've transferred it out of Penumbra into some other chain. Um, I'm immediately going to know that it was you because you didn't notice this like small end of this like, you know, value tagged at the very end, right? You like, I now know it's you because by, you know, the probability that anyone else is going to have exactly that, you know, end 
like little decimal tail place is pretty low. Um, so, and this is actually a common but fingerprinting there, technique. But wouldn't there be gas? What up? <laughs> wouldn't there be gas fees somewhere? Yeah. So well, it, it depends on how it's paid, right? Okay. But but like if you were just to withdraw, for example, yeah, let's yeah. say you're paying gas fees and and Adam, and you know you're withdrawing Penumbra to a separate place, you you end up with this like extra little tidbit at the end. Um, I think some people have used this as a fingerprinting technique at some point, but I don't recall who. Yeah, I guess where. like the the way that I would frame this just like as a kind of like general like intuition on why this is a problem is if you think of like, okay, how much entropy is revealed? How, how much information is my transaction revealing? If that is including publishing an amount, like an am if you have like, you know, a 32, 64 bit amount, that's a lot of bits of data that you could potentially leak. Henry, the differential privacist. Right. <laughs> um, but, but coming back to the, the liquidity position side of the DEX, the thought process is that there's a kind of a fundamental trade-off between how much control you have over the execution of your liquidity on the one hand and your privacy on the other hand. And although for sort of normal users, I think it's unreasonable to expect like, oh, you should just like, you know, carefully think about your amounts and never mess up <laughs> um, <laughs> for somebody who's running a kind of actively managed market making system they're having to think about okay what is the information in the market what prices am i setting and so on and so i think it's like a little less unreasonable to have you know as in that part of the system the idea that like you know maybe you decide that you should be thinking about sort of like what information your trades are revealing leaking yeah um and so that's the reason that i, I phrase as sort of being these sort of two trade-off points on privacy versus execution control where if you just want to do a swap and have the most amount of privacy possible you just submit it as a swap if you're doing market making then like you kind of need to get good right all right even in the case of the swaps, though, you still, you know, unless you have a lot of people swapping, you still have this notion of differential privacy, right? Like even just, even if you just batch everyone's trades together, right? If I also know something, like let's say there aren't that many people trading with the, you know, the market, there's like you and someone else, right? I can reasonably infer, if I know something else about you, I could reasonably infer that how much you traded or something of the like, but it's much harder yeah. Right. Because there's, there's very little public information. The, the only information that's made public is um, kind of what everyone traded in aggregate, as opposed to like any one individual person. Um, um, one of the ideas that we've been thinking about that on, on the client side, actually, is the idea of having some kind of UI for doing trading where a user can specify their time preference. Mm. where they can on some kind of slider between like, I want this to happen right away versus I want this to happen over, you know, the next like five minutes or the next hour or the next eight hours, whatever, and have the uh, client side UI be able to automatically prepare a kind of randomized subdivision of their like meta swap and submit that in individual unlinkable transactions at like randomized sub intervals. So um, wait, so you're actually essentially implementing a time-weighted average pricing yeah, but mechanism. It's, but, but it's randomized. But and yeah, with extra randomization, right. well, that's and pretty sick. The okay. thing that's really cool about this is that for the user, you actually get sort of two benefits at once. Number one is that you get some kind of hedge against execution risk. Like maybe you get batched in a swap with some like whale that's trading in the opposite direction or the same direction. Yeah, the, the same, same direction. direction. And that like wrecks your price. But since you did this like randomized average price mechanism, it only affected a small part of your trading. Um, and you also get this privacy benefit that even if, you know, you end up, you get unlucky, nobody else was trading in the same block as you and the batch size is a batch size of one. Well, okay, you're only revealing this randomized sub amount that that reveals much less information about your your total trade intent. Right. So, but it, the the interesting part is this goes back to the previous conversation, right? Is that this whole notion requires, like, the notion of privacy, right? Requires having more people interacting with the system. So it's this like Ouroboros of like, you know, you have to have people in the system in order to have privacy in order to like 
ideally also have more people in the system in order to have privacy. Yeah. The, right? the way that I would put that, which is actually like, you know, specifically intended to, to nerd snipe Guillermo. Damn it. Is that <laughs> um, when you're optimizing for privacy, Oh no. This is not like a convex optimization problem. <laughs> it's so, not? Wait, something <laughs> isn't a convex optimization problem? And, I never and, would have guessed. And um and so the 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 but the reason that that is like relevant is that um the local minima is not the global minima or maximum, you know, depending on which way you frame the optimization problem. If you're trying to get the most privacy, maybe you decide, "Oh, I'm going to build a bunch of um, pieces of this system so that every action is as private as possible and it's impossible for anybody to leak any information. But then by doing so, I've sort of, I've locally optimized for making all the transactions private, but I've curtailed the functionality of the system so much that now it has no users. And so it's like, oh, I have very good privacy within a very small anonymity set, whereas another set of engineering trade-offs might have slightly weaker privacy properties for each individual transaction, but then cause the system to be much more useful and have a much larger set of users. And so you maybe have like slightly weaker privacy, but like within a much larger set. And so mm -hmm. on balance, that's actually better. It, that, that's the, what I mean by it's sort of this like very um, like complex optimization problem. And one way that that plays out with the, the swaps is... We're planning to have Penumbra do the batching at block uh, level resolution. So when you submit a, a swap, the trades that it will be batched, batched together with are just the trades in that block. And if there's no other trades in that block, then you're in a batch size of one. And the mm -hmm. reason for that is, although that's you know from a privacy standpoint, maybe it would be more optimal if you said, oh, you have to wait for like, you know, five minute intervals or hour long intervals or something. But in that case, I think it becomes a lot less useful as a trading product. And in that case, you end up with, okay, well, there, there's this like weirdo, like privacy project that's only, only used by the like, you know, weird nerds who care about privacy. <laughs> and then you end up being, you know, private within a much smaller set. Whereas if you build something that is intended to be like, you know, best as a trading system, then you can do things on the the client side, like that kind of like randomized average pricing mechanism that kind of mitigates the risk of the individual batch being, you know, batch of one or something, um, while preserving the system for people who just want to do trading. Because ultimately, we want Penumbra to be providing just like better execution, even if you don't care about the privacy part at all you should still be using penumbra to do trading because the fact that the market making allows private strategies means that you're, you're going to be able to have market makers with like much better capital efficiency and therefore like lower spread better prices for for traders interesting mm -hmm. i actually now i'm curious to ask you like you're in the cosmos ecosystem are you competing with osmosis? Ooh, Ooh. that's a spicy <laughs> question. I, I honestly, I don't think it's that spicy. Um, I mean, <laughs> okay. like, n no, not really. Uh, like osmosis is a DEX, but it is also a lot more than a DEX. Like osmosis is this sort of whole like DeFi hub for Cosmos. And so just pausing on the Cosmos part, and just looking at privacy projects generally, there's a lot of privacy projects that are trying to build some kind of like general purpose private system mm -hmm. with different kind of takes on what that means. For Penumbra, we're not trying to do that. We're trying to build like one useful private application. We are an app chain that's a DEX and we're doing one thing, which is private trading and private market making. And with that kind of in mind, I think that that probably clarifies like why I don't really see this as being competitive with osmosis. Um, if anything, there's this kind of like hybridization because we're both in this um, interchain ecosystem. I think there's going to be a lot of interaction between users who use both Penumbra and osmosis. Yeah. And there's all these things that osmosis does as this like DeFi hub 
that Penumbra is just like not going to do. Mm -hmm. And it's mm -hmm. actually because of IBC and because of the existence of other chains like Osmosis or like Juno or like the Cosmos Hub or whatever, that it's possible for us to have this like very narrow, differentiated product strategy. And that's another lens that I think is interesting to compare sort of the state of the ecosystem today versus say, you know, four or five years ago, right? If you wanted to yeah. build an L1 four years ago, well, your L1 is going to be this like isolated little universe. So you'd better make sure that like, you know, you have a programmability story that you have like all of these pieces of like what it means to be an L1. You're going to have to go and do like all this like biz dev to get it listed on all these exchanges. You have to like do all of this stuff. And all of that work is just repeated over all of these different projects. Mm -hmm. And the thing that's really cool about IBC and having a, a really solid cross-chain communication mechanism is that now individual projects can be differentiated while still having the sovereignty that comes with being their own chain, right? Mm -hmm. So we get the freedom to design a chain with like the data model that's compatible with privacy with all of the trade-offs that we think are important to make, but we get to do so as part of an ecosystem, right? Mm -hmm. Like we're not trying to build an ecosystem. We like live in a society of other blockchains <laughs> and our users are going to interact with them. And so yeah. I don't really see it as being, you know, particularly sort of this kind of like zero mm -hmm. sum competition or anything like that. I actually want to follow up on this. So you said you're IBC enabled, but are you actually using the Cosmos SDK as the foundation or did you have to like create a lot of this on your own and then just use the IBC modules? Um, so yeah, maybe it's helpful to give a little bit of context for people who are not like, you know, totally Cosmos, Cosmos nerds. The, I think a useful analogy for the Cosmos SDK is that it's sort of like the like rails for blockchains in that if you want to like do a blockchain project, you can like generate this kind of opinionated scaffold of, you know, reasonable implementation of various blockchain stuff. And then you can write your own extra, if you want to do like one custom thing, you can add that in as a module and like yep. all the other stuff is, is written for you. Um, the Cosmos SDK sits on top of Tendermint, which is the consensus engine. And so there's this separation between the consensus layer that's determining what was in the blocks and what the blocks are and the application level that's determining what the meaning of those transactions are right mm -hmm. so to tendermint a transaction is just like a blob of bytes that gets passed to the application and then it's the application that gets to decide what to do with it and if you're if you're trying to build a, a blockchain that's like mostly the same as other chains but does like oh this is our thing that we do differently yeah, yeah. then i think that's actually a really reasonable approach Right. But for us, the data model of a shielded chain is just so different from a transparent chain. Uh, and the whole state model is different. We have all these different design concerns. So for us, we use Tendermint as this kind of off the shelf consensus piece. But everything on top of that is our own custom application that is it. written in Rust. It is built around this kind of baseline of the shielded pool as our kind of fundamental store of value, uh, which is quite different from, say, having accounts. Um, and uh, we have our own IBC implementation that oh. uses, that's written in Rust, that uses some of the IBC libraries from Informal, but our uh, IBC state machine is, is integrated with our app. Okay, um, so you actually, had to redo parts of that then. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. that's a lot of work, <laughs> I guess. It's been yeah. a journey, I suspect, to say the least. Well, yes. <laughs> um, so the good news, the good news is... Henry is very good at long pauses, I gotta say. No, He's I love got it. a good dramatic pause yeah. game. Um, yeah. <laughs> So the, the good news is that uh, we were actually the, the first um, non-Cosmos SDK chain to open a connection, an IBC connection to the Cosmos hub this wow. summer. So we got one of our test nets. I mean, it required some amount of like manual poking, but it did work. Um, 
And so that was a pretty cool milestone. So the way that IBC works is that you have two chains and they're trying to communicate with each other. Mm -hmm. And the way they do that is each chain is going to run a light client of the other chain so that it can understand and, and verify its counterparty's consensus state. And then also has to have a way for what the state commitment that's in the block header uh, is actually a way to understand what that's actually committing to and be able to read messages that were sent by the other chain. So that kind of factors into three separate pieces. The first piece is the consensus specific light client. For us, because we're using Tendermint, we didn't have to do anything on that. We just, because right. we're another chain. So that Tendermint one you chain. could reuse. So and that's, that's good because that's the part of the counterparty chain that actually has to run code. The second part is there's a standardized way to express like a generic Merkle proof so that regardless, the idea anyway, is that regardless of what type of like Merkle tree the counterparty chain is using, there should be some way that you can just like plug in the proof. Um, and then the third part is that there's some kind of standardized system of like how you encode messages into your chain state so that your counterparty chain can read them. And I think actually the IBC spec is like for all of the like warts and, you know, we know where the bodies are buried and whatever, <laughs> like is actually remarkably difficult to build a generic protocol when you only have one implementation. And although there were some like weird, you know, quirks, this is like the like Bob Ross, like, you know, there's no mistakes, just happy accidents. <laughs> we'll just add another layer of hashing in here to make the code happy. Um, it, it is actually, po you know, it was possible for us to build our own custom chain and submit proofs of what its state was to the Cosmos hub, which, you know, clearly is like not code we control. And like that code that's already running was able to... Um, you know, understand what our state is. And I think that's a really cool accomplishment that we nice. were able to just kind of permissionlessly plug into that. There is in IBC though, there is a message passing la layer as well, right? Like, I guess the question here is like, would you be able to do something on one chain that interacts into Penumbra, like under the hood with the setup that you have? Yeah, so there's, once you have this kind of message passing layer, there's various kind of, application level stuff that you can put on top of that. One simple application, which is the one that we're aiming to support first, is just token transfers. Another application that is very cool is interchain accounts and also interchain queries. So uh, this is a way that you can, for instance, have on one chain some kind of verifiable query result of data on another chain. Oh, OK. Um, that's the interchain queries. Interchain accounts is where you can have an account on one chain directly control an account on another chain by like passing messages back and forth. Um, so those are like kind of more advanced features and we're not planning to implement them initially, but in the longer term, it's something that we're thinking about. And there's also some potential like quite cool twists that we could do on those. So one idea that we've just kind of thought about is building an implementation of interchain accounts where instead of a normal setup where you just have two chains, you know, each with their own account set, and here's my account on chain A and I'm controlling this account on chain B, on Penumbra we don't have accounts. But what we could do potentially is have a way for the Penumbra chain itself to have a pooled account on each of its counterparty chains. So we would only have control over a single account and then track who controlled what assets within that account internally to Penumbra mm. inside of the shielded pool. Ooh, wow. So that you could... It would if, all come from one account on yeah, that other chain, but like, you would actually be able to direct where right, it's actually going. Right. Oh, so interesting. That's what you could do like um, actions on other chains uh, from Penumbra. Penumbra yeah. Wow. Without having to sort of reveal exactly, you know, like you could have, for instance, like the Penumbra account on the Cosmos Hub. Yeah, yeah. And there's some atoms in it and somebody can make a 
transaction on Penumbra that's like, oh, I'm using my like bearer token that represents control of like 100 atoms worth of this account and I'm staking them to like the occlusion validator. Wow. And that's my action. And like that <laughs> action Shout fundamentally. Out to <laughs> yeah. And I would say, yeah, why or not ZK, ZK validator? validator. Anyway. Well, look, I, it's important to have like decentralized yes. Uh, 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 yes, yes, of course. Systems. Um this is really some big brain stuff. I don't know. I love but, it. But yeah, the, the I think there's a, a really cool kind of opportunity for for penumbra when we're implementing these kind of interchain standardized uh features where it's like how can we implement this in a way that is both compatible with the standard but also is like doing something that's kind of unique for the capabilities that we have from penumbra wow switching gears uh maybe a little bit from from slightly i guess well we, we were talking about ibc recently but but from the philosophical part to kind of how do how do you enable like private transactions with global state is already in itself not an obvious thing right and you talked a little bit about this in your you know presentation in ck summit uh but uh, you know could you describe exactly like how, how does penumbra work right and it feels like if it were so easy i feel like everyone would have you know made a private dex but in fact uh, as we've yeah, referenced on, uh, as we referenced on many yeah previous episodes, uh, building a private dex is really damn hard. So and and you know I guess how did you how did you manage it? How how did you like yeah, what is well, I mean it's not I I want to yeah. be clear it's not done yet. We're that's still right, working right, fine, through fine. it, but but um, even having a reasonable plan yeah. for it, I think, is non-trivial. So I think um, probably a good way to kind of frame the problem is by thinking about the kind of basic sort of state and data models of blockchains and how we end up building private chains. Um, and this mm -hmm. is totally independent, by the way, of any sort of specific details about the proving system, whatever. That's a whole awesome piece of engineering, but it's kind of orthogonal to this issue, which is like, what is the data? How do you represent state on the chain? So if you think about like a transparent chain, like Ethereum, you've got this like big ball of global state, which is like, here is everything that is on Ethereum. And a transaction has some kind of description of, these are some state changes that we're gonna make to that state. And you have the nodes, they come to consensus on those transactions, and then to execute them, each transaction basically takes a lock on the entire world and does whatever changes it's going to make. All the nodes execute those, and then they've sort of progressed from like state to state to state. And so the, the whole paradigm is around global mutable state. Mm -hmm. In order to build a shielded chain, okay, we're, we're trying to use like snarks for something, right? How do we do that? First, you have to fragment all of the application state and kind of rewind to this more UTXO style model like in Bitcoin, where instead of having one giant ball of global state, you have immutable composable state fragments. This is like the sort of cool way to think about UTXOs <laughs> is that each transaction output is like one fragment of the chain state and when I have a transaction that has some list of input TXOs and produces some new outputs, what I'm doing is I'm composing together those state fragments and then producing a new set of state fragments, and those are going to get included in the chain. And although in Bitcoin, you know, that's a, just a simple kind of value transfer application, you could do a lot more complex uh, types of state uh, in, in principle. Okay, so why would we want to have this kind of fragmented state? The reason is that this way we can move all the state off chain. So instead of having this like big like Merkle tree of uh, state fragments, we're going to replace all of those state fragments with cryptographic commitments to the state. And that way the on-chain data is just this big tree of commitments that don't reveal anything about the data that they're committing to. Mm -hmm. And now in my transaction, I can have instead of, okay, I'm taking these three pieces of state, combining them together and making, you know, these two new ones. Um, 
I can do a ZK proof of I have honestly formed a state transition that consumes certain states and produces some new states. And now the details of that state transition are completely private. All the chain sees is like, okay, here are some new state fragments that were produced. And also here are some serial numbers of some other fragments that were consumed. Right. And this is from a privacy point standpoint, this is like, okay, great. We've like solved the problem because we've moved all the execution off chain. We're just supplying verifications that the execution was correct. And so the chain doesn't like learn anything. But what's the what's the kind of problem here? Why aren't we all using private chains then if this solves the problem? <laughs> and the big thing that you lose is the ability to access shared state. Global state. Mm. Right. It turns out that actually having like public shared state is like kind of the whole point of having the blockchain. <laughs> Going back to the kind of big sort of philosophical discussion at the beginning and the point about not wanting to have a technology where you have to coordinate off chain before you can use the coordination tool. The reason that everybody loves to have shared state on chain is that it means that they only have to coordinate with the chain. Mm -hmm. They don't have to go find some counterparty. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why losing shared state is a problem. But why exactly did we lose the access to shared state? The issue is that when somebody is submitting a transaction on a transparent system, because the execution actually happens on chain, some pieces of that execution's inputs can have a late binding. So if you think of the kind of overall state transition that's created by some transaction, there will be like various inputs to that computation and various outputs. And some of those inputs are going to be specified by the user when the user is creating and signing the transaction, but others won't be. And so for example, with a swap, right, somebody is going to sign over you know, I'm sending this amount of tokens to the AMM and I am hoping to get like this type of token in return. But another input to that computation is what is the current state of the AMM? What are the reserve quantities? And you need those inputs in order to be able to compute the final outputs. And it's because the execution is actually happening on chain that someone can create a transaction where they've filled in like some of the pieces and then they've left some of the other pieces as kind of like, okay, well, this will be filled in by like whatever the chain state is when I actually get to be executed. Right. And you can also use this as a perspective to on kind of the whole like MEV games and like transaction ordering and stuff. Like if you're signing a transaction where there's like you know, I'll take, you know, whatever the current thing is, then like, obviously there's going to be some kind of game about like, can I rearrange your transactions so that you get an unfavorable input, right? But that's really kind of the, the key property that lets you build useful applications is having some way to interact with the public shared state. And if we think of what's happening when somebody makes a private transaction, because they've moved the execution off chain and they're only supplying a proof, they actually, it's a, like a ZK proof is a proof of knowledge. So they actually mm -hmm. have to have like complete exact knowledge of the state transition that they're proving about. And so they have to sort of, they, they have to seal all of the inputs and all of the state that that transi state transition touches at the point that they make the transaction. And that would appear to block people from ever interacting with the shared state in, a, in any meaningful way. Yeah, f fundamentally, yeah, exactly. The, the, the big problem is when things are fully private, right, is when you have the shared state, right, like knowledge of that shared state should not be required directly in order to like perform the action you want to perform. And often it's not known at the time of creation. I mean, again, just a restatement of what you were saying, but that this is a huge problem with markets, right? Whenever you submit an order to a market, you often won't know the price that the order lands at. I mean, unless you, you can do many things, but the point is, or you won't know the time when it lands at, or like things like that, um, which is not inherently possible to do with 
at least zero knowledge proofs, although there might be some weird homomorphic encryption stuff you can do. But so what did you do? What do so, you do? So the thought process is that really the sort of fundamental issue there is how do you mediate concurrent access to shared state? The problem is, oh, all these people who are making their transactions, doing their execution on their own device, and then submitting that to the chain. The problem is, well, they, they're all kind of try, trying to concurrently access or modify some kind of shared state, and we don't have really a way to coordinate that. So, you know, we can't make it happen. And if you look at, you know, not blockchains, but just like systems programming in general, you can think of the approach to uh, accessing shared state on a chain like Ethereum is like, okay, we have like one big global mutex and we've like put all of the data under this lock and like every transaction acquires the lock, does stuff and then releases it. And if you just think about systems programming design, if your goal is, oh, I wanna build this kind of high performance, like scalable concurrent system, the architecture that you use to do that is not like I put all of the state in like one giant lock. That's how you get the bad programs. Um, <laughs> the bad programs, generally speaking. Right. And so another approach would be you could try to do some kind of more fine-grained locking. You could either build that into the transaction mechanism, or you could do some kind of like, you know, very fancy uh, Ethereum implementation that's basically like the like out-of-order x86 core, but for yep. Ethereum, where yep. we just kind of like secretly go in and figure out all the data dependencies and then, and then like execute everything. it yep. and, you know, give you this like as-if execution through a heroic amount of engineering effort. <laughs> and like, that's a thing that I'm sure is going to happen be just because of like the total weight in that ecosystem. I think but, it's kind of already happening, actually. There was a right. paper about this somewhat yeah. recently from Microsoft Research, right? But anyways. But but another, just from a systems design perspective, another approach to handling concurrency, which is actually like better, is <laughs> uh, an actor model with message passing. So the idea is instead of like, oh, different parts of the program are all trying to like con you know, access the same data and like share state or whatever, instead you say like, we're going to divide the program up into these like little actors that all execute independently and they'll communicate with each other through message passing. And that way you don't need to have any kind of like locking or synchronization because everything is just like passing messages to everything else. What would that look like in the context of this specific problem of how do we share state on chain? It would look like instead of your transaction having some code that makes a, a call to some smart contract and gets the result, your transaction would send a message to a smart contract describing something that you wanted to do. And then eventually that would execute and you would get a response from the smart contract asynchronously. So you're moving from a synchronous execution model where every transaction gets to lock the world to an async model where a transaction gets to send messages to an application, and then some computation will eventually be performed. And in that case, you can have a, a really cool kind of like batched processing model where each smart contract is going to execute once per block, but on input, all of the messages that all transactions sent during that block. And then it can perform you know, whatever kind of application-specific logic it wants to determine how to process those messages. So for some applications like uh, swaps, right, you can actually agglomerate all of those messages into a single batch trade and execute it at once. And now you've got this like, huge performance speed up because instead of uh, having to execute all those trades individually, you're only executing one trade per block and so you can be considerably more sophisticated about how you actually do that execution. But more generally, for other applications, you could also have some kind of app-specific logic that like chooses, like you know, for an auction protocol, you could sort the messages by bid or something like that. And the challenge now is like, okay, I've like sent a message to a contract. Like, what do I, you know, what is my transaction actually doing? And the thing that's kind of interesting is that. What this model lets you do is it, it lets you retain the setup where each user has their own state for their own account balance that is theirs. Mm -hmm. And they're interacting with this public state by sending messages to it. 
And so they can now have a kind of asynchronous programming model for their own side of that contract where they do some part of the computation and now they have to wait, they send out some message and they have to wait for a response. And you end up having a, a model that looks a lot like futures or some kind of async programming on the user state side, where for instance, if I'm doing a, a swap, I'm gonna make a transaction where I've submitted my swap inputs, I've like burned those input tokens, and now I need a way to like, you know, hang out while I wait for that swap to execute, but mm -hmm. be able to later demonstrate to the chain, oh, I actually did participate. And the way to think about that is you need a way to take all of the kind of intermediate state of that execution and somehow freeze it so that you can pick it up later, mm -hmm. which is exactly what happens when you do async programming with futures every time you have to wait for a message to come in, that's a different sort of intermediate point of this state machine. And the like really cool thing that we do in, in Penumbra is we have a way to Merkleize all of that intermediate state in a snark friendly way into the asset ID of an NFT that we record in the shielded pool. Um, so like if you, if you've done like Rust programming, for instance, you may know of this like idea of like, oh, you have like ownership and you can only, you can have these like move semantics for your state machines so you know that you can't like accidentally do the same state transition twice. Well, actually if you have like, you know, a database that's re recording quantities of financial assets and you turn every intermediate state of your future into like a distinct you know, financial asset, then like you can reuse that infrastructure to, yep. to track the execution of the program. Right. Um, and so the way that the swap works is when I make a swap, I'm going to burn my input funds that I'm committing to the swap. I mint to myself a swap NFT whose asset ID, so that's, you know, one unit of an asset ID, which is a snark friendly hash of the trading pair, my input amounts, the address that I'm going to mint the notes to in the end. And that way, I'm, I'm verifying that all those things are consistent in the proof that I make when I submit my swap. Mm -hmm. And now, as soon as I see that that transaction has been included in a block, I'm also able to see what the results of the batch output are. Yep. because the, the actual trade is going to be executed at the end of that block. And now I can, in a second transaction, I can spend my swap NFT that recorded the details about my participation in the swap. And now I'll make a proof for the second half of this state transition, where I now have the results of the trade execution as a public input. And I can prove that I'm privately minting the correct pro rata share of that batch okay. output yeah. and that I'm sending it to the correct address that I signed over in the, in the first part of the transaction. And the, the thing that's really cool about that actually is that it means that you don't actually even need to have a separate signing step for this secondary like claiming uh, part of the, the execution because there's no way for the funds to be you know diverted to some it's other purpose else, yeah it's literally just your user agent kind of submitting a transaction that like finishes off the change to your private part of the state right cool it's it's very yeah the the, the notion is quite interesting right it's like separating out intermediate steps of a state machine right and then enumerating the intermediate steps in a very explicit way such that once a computation is completed which you know, in order for you to do a swap, you depend on data that you did not know at the time, right? Namely, how much was actually traded in the app, but to then, you know, you can, you can then use this like intermediate step to then complete the computation as if it would have happened kind of like purely on chain. The other thing that I think is really cool about it too, is that it actually, although this is a like designed around privacy, I think this actually has really cool implications for scalability too. Mm -hmm. Because if you think about the sort of sum total of the execution that is going to happen, 
if there's you know a whole bunch of trades because we're explicitly modeling here's the part of the computation that is only touching the per user state and here's the part of the computation that's touching the shared state yep. as like distinct concepts the execution of all the per user state changes is actually happening off chain on the user's device mm -hmm. and the execution of the shared uh, state changes is happening in one go in a batch where mm -hmm. you can get like hyper efficient batch processing in you know in the in the case of the swaps it's sort of the optimal thing because you can just batch all the swaps together and execute only a single trade but in general like batch processing lets you share work between items in the batch mm -hmm. and the extent to which that's true depends a little bit on your task but it's like very rare that you have like no sharing possible right so you get to have like hyper efficient public computation without having to have contention on the state access and the private side which is the per user data is like free from a scalability perspective because it's all happening on the, the user's, user's device. device. And the other thing that's different from like a ZK rollup, right, is that each user's proofs that they're forming are only about their own state transitions. That's right. So that's a small amount of proving to do. It's not like you have to appoint some sequencer to do this like giant proof of everybody's state transitions all at once. Yep. You're distributing the computational work out to the edge the actual end users, and then you're enabling the part of it that is necessarily shared to execute much more efficiently. Right. So you covered a lot of this in the talk at ZK Summit 8 as well. So I'll add a link to that in the show notes if anyone wants to, to see that. It's a good one. <laughs> I want to say a big thank you for coming on and sharing with us all of this kind of your journey and the kind of ideas that led to Penumbra, a lot of the thinking that you have around constructing it and some of these pretty cool innovations, findings, like had anyone else done that? Has anyone else tried to split uh, it? I don't think, I think this is, this is new. But I, the thing is that this, although I've described it in this kind of fairly general terms of like, oh, here's this kind of idea of uh, this whole arc system architecture, the way that we got there actually was not by starting with we're going to build this like generalized programmability thing and in terms of what we're actually focused on building we're still focused on we're going to do private swaps and we're going to make them good but what's interesting is that by focusing on that one specific problem the solution that we came up with is like oh here's a way that we can solve it in this case actually i think generalizes to a much more interesting state model than we would have got if we'd started from this kind of abstract like oh let's build this kind of like generalized thing mm -hmm. but without having like a really specific concrete use case very cool thank you so much for uh coming on with us and uh explaining i guess what do you call it the state model of uh for yeah, yeah. so all right, i guess the penumbra state model let's let's uh put a little trademark tm over somewhere cool. in there um <laughs> thanks again yeah it's been great so thanks again. I also want to say a big thank you to the ZK Podcast team, Tanya, Henrik, and Rachel, and to our listeners. Thanks for listening. Thanks.